In this video, I'd like to discuss postmodern criticism and, uh, and postmodern critique of, of literature and media. And before we get into the details, I want to preface this by saying that postmodern criticism can be really involved. Postmodern theory is really involved. There's a lot of depth. There's a lot of different ways of approaching it and different ways of doing it. So I want to preface this video by saying we're just going to cover the most basic elements of postmodern criticism. There's a lot more to dig into here uh, and, and a lot of materials that you can explore. So I just want to give you the brief uh, thousand foot view overview of postmodern criticism so that we can have a foundation to start from here. So with that in mind, a postmodern criticism, as you might guess, is, uh, you know, the, the the, uh, the the suffix uh, the preface post means after right so um, so postmodern criticism comes after what was known as modern criticism what more do you need to know right well we need to know what modern criticism is and we'll get to that and then we need to know how that impacts postmodern criticism so postmodern criticism uses artifacts or examines artifacts through a framework uh, that uses something that stipulates that there are essentially no singular truths or narratives. There's no one, you know, right way to do things. There's no run one right way to look at something or to, to do something or no right a format for putting together literature or music or other or other artifacts, other pieces of art. Right? There's there's no there's just chaos. There's no one way to do things. This is in direct contact contrast to modern criticism, which says that there's a central narrative that everything is feeding into this one idea whatever that idea is that uh, that america is number one that love is good and conquers all that the good guys win and bad guys lose those are those are central narratives that we oftentimes feed into with these sub narratives so every sub narrative every piece of work every artifact is going to feed into that and somehow uh, feed into that central narrative so when you read a book in the modern in, that's a, that's a piece of modern literature it's going to somehow feed into that central narrative when you hear a song it's going to it's going to conform to the ideals of of what uh, that, that music industry says it should be at that time and feed into that central narrative and the topics will and the, the structure of the songs will and the movies are the same way so uh, everything about it feeds into this central narrative right well postmodern criticism says that there is no central narrative because there is no singular truth there is no one right thing there's no one way to do things so all these sub narratives in postmodern criticism are just going wherever they want there is no central narrative to feed into so it's just it's just chaos in that regard so so each sub narrative can really explore and, and do whatever it wants so we see this one one way we can look at this is through music music industry through the years and music industry now um so when you think about the early beatles music now i'm talking about i'm not talking about rubber soul i'm not talking about you know sergeant pepper i'm not talking i'm talking about early beatles music i'm talking about uh, i want to hold your hand and love love me do right that music conforms to the central narrative in a variety of ways right it conforms to that central narrative in that the topics of that song are appropriate it's it's you know it's about uh, it's about an innocent love it's about holding hands it's about this kind of stuff uh, so the content is there and then just like every, all, most music of that time the format is the same it's verse chorus verse chorus bridge chorus outro right <laughs> end of song that's how most songs were structured back then if you go back and listen they all have the similar format because that's and they were all feeding into the central narrative right because they were pieces of modern work modern works of art at that time right uh, but postmodern uh, oh and we can see this in contemporary days um it's still this this happens today if you if you look at the music of taylor swift there's not much uh, in an, uh, whether you're a fan or not i don't know but uh, there's not much uh, uh, there's not much ingenuity there's not a lot of, it's verse chorus verse chorus bridge chorus out you know and it's pretty much the same four chords and the same type of, you know, same type of topics a lot of times. And, um, you know, what, even if it's not about, uh, you know, love conquers all now it's about heartbreak and that kind of fits into the modern mode as well. But, but Taylor Swift very much follows that, that what we would call the modern theory approach of, of uh, creating music. It's, it's very kind of formulaic and, and follows, it falls into that pattern. But back in the 70s, then you had, especially in what we would call prog rock or progressive rock, you had bands that come out and said, you know, we don't like that format. We don't want to do that. We don't want to have that verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus out. And we don't want to be stuck to a particular time signature uh, the whole time. So you had bands like Yes and Early Genesis and one of my favorite bands of all time, Rush, that played around with time signatures, mixing different time signatures within the same song, writing songs about, you know, kind of a dystopian future or about just random random stuff that wasn't like 
the norm for pop music it wasn't you know again everybody love each other and everybody and level went out and stuff like that it was about different things uh, you know so um, so it was very very different in that regard as well so um so and the modern day equivalent to that in some ways would be tool for example if, you, if you're into that kind of music tools with the again mixture of sound uh, of time signatures which is unusual uh don't follow the first chorus first chorus bridge chorus out uh, format all the time or a lot of times so i'm uh, just doing their own thing they're not they're not trying to, to fit into that particular format uh, so they're, they're 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 out there on their own they're they're very much a postmodern uh, artist you know, tool is. So with that, no, I mean, that just gives you a, sort of an idea of what we mean by, by groups not falling in or, or, or pieces of art or artifacts not falling into the standard, uh, format of what we think of as, as, you know, appropriate or modern or fitting into that central, uh, central narrative, the central truth. So, uh, again, the major premises, the first major premises of, of postmodern criticism is that there is no singular truth. There's no one right thing there's no one wrong thing there's no correct way to do things there's no uh, one theme that we ought to be following in falling into and, and trying to promote there's no singular truth there's there's just everybody doing what they do and what they want to do and, and that's how not only people are producing these artifacts but that's how people are viewing them as well that they're viewing them through their own lens that they're not viewing them through um, this singular you know filter a frame of reference that would lead to that central uh, narrative um, that there is no singular truth and they say they would say that, that this really is founded in i mean if you want to, if you want a great example of this they would say look at the language i mean our language isn't even singular in what it means and how it's constructed you could they'd say you can look at a very simple sentence uh like time flies like an arrow right and that even that doesn't mean one thing that can mean several things so if we look at it like uh, like time is the is the noun or the object in this in this situation time flies like an arrow meaning time passes quickly right it, it flies through there it moves so quickly time flies like an arrow right? but we can look at that same sentence in a slightly different structure and we could say time flies like an arrow and by that we could mean let's get some flies Let's get some flies and we'll have them do, you know, laps or whatever. <laughs> we'll train them to do racing or, but we'll time them from this area to this area and we'll, we'll, we'll use a stopwatch and we'll time them. Right. And we'll see if we can time those flies as we can an arrow. Uh, but even that's not, I mean, so we've got two different, two different interpretations of that same sentence. Uh, but even then we could have uh, an additional one. Uh, time flies like an arrow. In other words, these time flies. Right? These actual flies that are that are somehow connected to time, time flies, in other words, singularly, time flies, they like an arrow, meaning they, they like arrows or they could like a particular arrow or whatever, but they have an affic affection or affinity for arrows or this particular arrow. These time flies really appreciate and enjoy this particular arrow. Right? So postmodern people look at this and say, look, we can't even trust our language. We can't even have a singular definition of a simple sentence like this. How could we possibly have a single narrative that runs through everything and, and expect all this art to really flow into it? And it just doesn't make any sense. They would say, they would say that's just not realistic, right? So, um, so that's where we get postmodernism, uh, that there is no singular truth, right? And because of all this, they would say creators and evaluators alike share in the co-creation of meaning. It's not just somebody putting something out there and then you have this absolute understanding of it that everybody who sees it comes to the same conclusion. They would say that these creators and evaluators are sharing a co-creation of meaning that the, that the evaluators, whoever's looking at and, and taking in that artifact, uh, it shares in the creation of meaning of what it means because they're putting their own interpretation, their own spin on it. And, uh, so you have two people that are involved or at least two people that are involved in the creation of meaning through this particular artifact, right? Because you have the, the, both the creator and the, um, um, evaluator looking at it. Uh, we also need to consider uh, through the, the in the postmodern lens that people or groups in power construct these narratives artificially that sometimes the, the because i mean there's no singular truth postmodern people would say there's no singular truth there's no singular central narrative right but that doesn't mean people don't try to create them in order to uh, get people to look at things a particular way and get people to respond to things in a in a particular way and and so forth right so the that these people or these groups 
could be a single person, could be a group. They construct these narratives. They construct these narratives. They construct, you know, America first. They construct love conquers all. They, con they construct good guys beat bad guys, right? Because they want people to uh, move into this particular narrative. They want people to feed into that. Okay? So that these people in or, or, or groups have power. They construct these narratives artificially so that there's no singular truth. There's no singular central narrative in, in postmodern theory, but that doesn't mean people don't try to, to create them in order to kind of funnel people into it. Yeah. Um, finally, the, the role of narrative and author are fundamentally auth off altered, excuse me, altered in postmodern theory in postmodern criticism, um, because there's that co-creation of meaning. The, the, so there's, there's no just like singular narrative, soak it all in. There's no, um, you know, author rules all, author creates the world, author does this, because you have that co-creation of meaning between the, uh, the creator and the evaluator. So the role of those things, which have, have you know, in, in the modern perspective are so important, the narrative and the author are so important in those, in the modern perspective, but in the postmodern perspective of criticism, they're, they're really uh, not the same role. Okay. So what are some common questions we need to ask when we're engaging in postmodern criticism of literature or media? So one of the first ones is how is language thrown into what we call free play or questioned in the work? I showed you an example of free play of language with that uh, time flies like an arrow thing that we can interpret language differently. We can use language differently. So how does language or how do these representative symbols, uh, how are they thrown into that free play or questioned in the work? What kind of, uh, you know, um, questions can they lead to about how things are organized and, and, uh, and what they mean by those words, right? What we actually mean, what's the meaning of those words? How is that thrown into free play in this work? How does the work undermine or contradict generally accepted truths? Um, so again, modern, uh, critique, modern criticism says that these are the truths. These are uh, things we should believe. And, and, and even if those aren't the things that we have people in groups that are artificially creating those. So how does this work put that into question? How does this work go against what people would normally think of as appropriate and, uh, and effective in this type of work? How does the author or character omit, change, or reconstruct memory or identity? Um, so how are they you know, working outside of what we would consider the norm for, um, for those things, for, for um, memory and identity? How are they you know, altering those things or, and, and uh, using them to, to the way they want and, uh, and kind of shaping it in that regard? How does, work, how does a work fulfill or move outside the established conventions of its genre? So again, there's these rules in modern literature, modern media that, that say, this is how you're supposed to do things. This is how music is supposed to be made. It's verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, out. Uh, that's, and so how does this music uh, or, or, or television show or movie work outside of the, the conventions? You know, another great example of this type of thing uh, would be the work of uh, the film work of Quentin Tarantino. Uh, especially early on, who, uh, with, starting with Pulp Fiction, even really starting with Reservoir Dogs, and then Pulp Fiction was where it really blew up, um, that just defied what was supposed to happen in movies or what was supposed to be appropriate. Another example from that era, the, the, the 90s where the film really started, where film really started into postmodern work, uh, really in a, in a broader way. Another example, that would be the movies of Kevin Smith, if you're familiar with any of those clerks. Um, a little bit mall rats, but clerks, uh, chasing Amy dogma. Those are, those are movies that, that really go outside of the norm. They were, they were considered very off the beaten path because they didn't follow the strictures of, of storytelling. They didn't follow the narratives and uh, didn't follow, you know, the guy always gets the girl in the end. Uh, they didn't follow everything always works out. <laughs> in fact, a lot of times it did not work out effectively in his movies, uh, but it, it tended toward realism. And so, how did that work? How does that work in general work outside of the established conventions of its genre? What the expectations are there? In addition, we can ask how does the work deal with the separation or lack thereof between the writer, work, and the reader? So, especially in modern times with digital media, we can get into what, what is the separation between this work? Is there any separation between this work? Because a lot of times now we can be almost interactive with the artifact and, um, Really, and that engages the the person in a different way, 
you know, the, per, the, the viewer and the, the person who's uh, evaluating it, um, in, it engages them in a, in a totally different way and engaging in different senses and things. So, um, so how does that deal with that separation or lack thereof? What ideology does the artifact seem to promote? Again, you're not, you're not stuck to, you know, we've got to write something or, or produce something that fits into this mold. Now we can have it fit into whatever mold we want. So what ideology are they um, promoting there, right? There was some discussion around uh, the Dark Knight movies, uh, the Dark Knight, I think it was, with the, where, um, whether there was a statement on uh, the government you know, intrusion and government, you know, the Patriot Act and things with the government being able to access digital things. And is that fair? Is that, is that just, is that, uh, you know, free for people? Is that the cost of safety in a free society or, or not? So, I mean, there's some questions about, you know, what is this promoting? Is this, is this, is this just an action movie or is this promoting a particular ideology, a particular perspective on that type of viewpoint? Um, so what's the ideology that, uh, that it seems to be promoting? What is left out of the artifact that if, might inc if included might undermine the goal of the work? So what did they intentionally leave out? Because maybe it didn't fit into what they were trying to do, didn't fit into their particular narrative, uh, those types of things. And if we change the point of view of the artifact, say from one character to another or multiple characters, how would the story change? You know, what, how would that change the perspective? How would that change the outcome? How would that uh, again go against or or combat the typical uh, narrative that we would find in this type of genre and this type of work? So, uh, real quickly, I just want to run through one one, one example for you. And I picked a I picked a television show um, for this time. And, and so again, we're not going to examine any particular episode or anything. We're just going to generally look at the show and and try and apply some of these questions. Just very again a mile wide and an inch inch deep. We're not going to get really deep into these things. So, uh, but I chose one that I think a lot of people will have seen and uh, be familiar with. And if not, then you've probably heard about it enough to know a little bit about it. But I picked The Office. So we're going to examine the office just a little bit here uh, in terms of postmodern criticism. We're going to apply some post the framework of postmodern criticism over the office in general. So how's language thrown into free play or question in the work? I mean, there's a lot of uh, ways that they use language in, in the office, a lot of, you know, kind of uh, um, tongue in cheek references, things like that's what she said and, and uh, those types of things. But, uh, but also um, just the, the way that they use uh, office language or, or, you know, kind of business lingo to, uh, to let you know that um, a, this is an office, but B, they're not taking it too seriously that they're kind of making fun of those types of things. And, and uh, so uh, there's, there's some different uses of language in that way and just some uh, different, uh, some double entendres, some, some different ways that they use language that uh, probably wouldn't be uh, necessarily true in most sitcoms or most office places. Either. But how does this work undermine or contradict generally accepted truths? Well, it went against convention, first of all, in that they kind of, what they call, broke the fourth wall. They talked directly to the audience in some ways, although they did that through this documentary style. Not like some shows where the characters will have an aside with the camera and, and literally just talk to the audience. Um, this was more of a, a documentary style where they would be able to talk to the audience directly to the camera um, because they were aware of the camera. So that was the idea that they were aware of the cameras. And that was very different from uh, for that genre. Um, it also undermines some ideas about what it means to work in an office. I mean, it's obviously not a, a realistic portrayal in some ways of what would happen, but uh, uh, in, in an office. Um, so um, anyway, it contradicts a lot of things. How does the author or character omit, change, or reconstruct memory and identity? Well, I mean, you see some of the characters just change over time. And not that people don't change over time, but they make different decisions with these characters. Right? Uh, based on who's going to be here longer and who's not. And they give them different story arcs. And so you may, you know, just have you know, like, like Michael Scott, the, the main guy becomes more sympathetic over the course of the show, he becomes less of kind of this buffoon and, uh, and becomes you know, more uh, empathetic character, something that you're going to like. And so they just kind of forget the fact in some ways that he's this buffoonish kind of guy and because they want to change the direction of the character. Uh, so you have some things like that, that happen. Um, so the same thing with Dwight, they kind of give Dwight a heart in, in a sense and Angela a heart in a sense, because they wanted to take those characters in different directions. So he just kind of forgot some stuff and left some stuff, you know, left it in the past and moved on with wh where they wanted to take the characters. How does work fulfill or move outside of the established conventions of its genre? Well, again, a lot of ways that was the documentary style. So that was the one way that they did things that, uh, that was different. 
Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, but it was funny. It fulfilled the work, fulfilled the conventions of the genre in, in that it was funny. They had different story arcs and kind of followed the same kind of format that a sitcom would follow. Um, but they did so in a very different way with the filming and had different aspects of filming and different things that they did differently there. How does the work deal with the separation or lack thereof between the writer, the work and the reader? You know, I don't know. In, the, in this one, they, they, in the show, they, they, there wasn't as much separation. Um, they were more in tune, I think, than a lot of uh, shows with what was going on and what, what their audience was thinking. Uh, obviously, the audience had been very passionate about this even after the show's been off the air. So um, there's not a, a great deal of separation. So there's really a lack of separation, I would say, in this work. What ideology does the artifact seem to promote? You know, this is one that's kind of hard to, certainly not how to be good at your job, but it's, I think the ideology here is how to find the good in everything and everyone in different situations, right? Um, that, that in the end, all these people came to care for one another and, uh, in different ways. And so, um, that the, the, the people you work with are oftentimes your, your sort of second family. So it kind of falls into that ideology in a sense. Um, What's left out of the artifact that if included might undermine the goal of the work? Well, I mean, a realistic perspective of, of an office, for one thing, this place would have been out of business uh, after season one if they conducted themselves the way that they do in the show. So they left they left that out because it would undermine the goal. So it's one of those things you just have to accept it or not. And I remember talking years ago with a friend about, you know, James Bond and those kind of movies. And, and they were like, I don't like it because, you know, he just does all these things. It's not real. And I said, yeah, it's not real. That's not the point. It's not supposed to be real. It's supposed to be fun. And so you set aside the conventions of reality for that type of show. And I think you do the same thing for The Office. You set aside the fact that they would have been, you know, bankrupted and that company never would have survived and that office never would have survived and those people would not have been promoted and advanced and kept on and things like that. You, you set that aside because you understand it's fiction and, and you understand it's somewhat absurd. And so you, you allow for that and you let that go. If we change the point of view of the artifact, say from one character to another or multiple characters, how would the story change? Um, well, I think they did that in some ways in this show, to be honest. They, they changed the, uh, you know, initial, really at its heart, this is a love story between, about Jim and Pam. This, the whole show is a love story about Jim and Pam. And all the others are just kind of side characters, but they had the time and the opportunity and the, um, the, 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 frankly, the actors and the stories to work with that, uh, that they could take this in different directions. You, you saw much more focus on Michael Scott. The show became centered around him. Uh, then when he left the show, when Steve Carell left, left the show, you had this focus on, on, uh, uh, some other characters on Dwight, on, uh, on Andy, on, uh, Jim and Pam still, but, uh, but really these, these floating characters around, um, and determining who had the, the more compelling storyline at that moment. Um, so it did change, but, and, and it did change the, the tone of the show throughout the show. The idea that, you know, when, when the focus was on Michael Scott, it was really kind of fun and absurd and well, how wacky can he get? And then the show, the tone would change when the focus was on Jim and Pam to more of a, almost a, a relationship type drama, you know, kind of at first a will they, won't they? And then a, a later on a how will they and so forth. So, um, so it did take on multiple uh, perspectives, I think, and it did change the story somewhat when they did so. Okay. Not necessarily a great example, but uh, but I wanted to give you some idea of what we were looking at there with postmodern. Again, this one's this one's thick. This one's kind of deep. It's kind of thick and hard to get through in some ways. But but uh, you can do it. You can you can understand things from this perspective by thinking about okay, who not only who benefits from this, but what's their what's their purpose here? What's the, what's the end goal for this person? What's the end goal for this situation? What are they trying to accomplish? And, uh, and, and just really thinking critically about that and then thinking about what is it they're promoting with, how does that contradict the, the, the norm, so to speak, the central narrative that, that pe other people are putting out. So, um, give some thought to that as you move through the idea of postmodern uh, criticism here. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'm happy to respond to emails and, and discuss things uh, that way. So don't hesitate to email me. In the meantime, get out there and uh, start looking at things through that postmodern lens.